play. So do institutional investors who control trillions of dollars of savings. But how can these players mobilize capital in a way that maximizes impact, recognizing that we are running out of time? Most importantly, how can we avoid greenwashing, where we fool ourselves into believing that we're fixing the problem when all we're doing is extending business as usual financing arrangements or even making things worse? Here to discuss these issues with me is Noel Quinn. Noel Quinn is the Group Chief Executive for HSBC. He also chairs the Sustainable Markets Initiative's Financial Services Task Force, which works to accelerate efforts within the banking sector to move toward a net zero economy. Tariq Fancy. Tariq Fancy previously served as the Chief Investment Officer for Sustainable Investing at BlackRock in 2018 and 2019, where he was responsible for the integration of environmental, social, and governance, ESG, considerations across the investment activities of the world's largest asset manager. He currently serves as CEO of Rumi, an education technology nonprofit that he founded in 2000. And 13. Anne Simpson is the Managing Investment Director for Board Governance and Sustainability at CULPAS, the California Public Employees Retirement System, responsible for strategic initiatives across the total fund where she is a member of the Investment Management Committee and reports to the CEO. She currently chairs the Steering Committee and Asia Advisory Group for Climate Action 100 Plus a global investment investor alliance of, believe it or not, $55 trillion, which Culpers convened and co-founded. Coming up a little bit later in the program, we have an interview with Jae Hyuk Oh, Vice President of New Energy Business Development at Hyundai Motor Company, who has been incubating new energy businesses, mostly in the area of hydrogen the reuse and recycling of EV batteries and energy as a service since 2017. I'm joining you today from Bloomberg headquarters in New York, and I'd like to welcome our global new economy community. We also welcome our viewers tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities throughout this conversation for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen, and I'll invite you to vote in live polling in the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, a simple refresh of your browser should help get things back on track. I caught up last week with Noel Quinn, um, who in his role as chair of the Financial Services Task Force is focusing on developing pathways to meet a number of climate goals, such as net zero, carbon emissions targets, climate solutions, and accelerating investment into sustainable infrastructure in the lead up to the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow this November. I asked Noel what we can expect from the financial sector on climate and what he expects from the upcoming summit in Glasgow. What are your expectations for COP26? A UN report last week said government pledges on carbon are way off target and we're on track for 2.7 degrees of warming versus, of course, the Paris goal of 1.5 degrees. Andrew, I can only speak as I find at the moment in the dialogue I'm having with clients. The pace of change that's taking place in the customers I'm talking to, in all markets we operate in, is just accelerating. I think COVID has really given a wake-up call to everyone on how important this topic is and how fragile the world economy is to a natural event. So I think there's a huge amount still to do. It would be great if we had started earlier as, as a world, but there is an awful lot of activity taking place. The governments have their role to play, but we as institutions and private institutions have our role to play. And I do see COP26 really about bringing the private sector onto an agenda that was really a public sector agenda at, at the previous COP, and it's a combined effort. How do you assess the risk to your own portfolio from climate change? For instance, the risk that fossil fuel companies are going to be displaced by clean energy, the risk that whole swaths of coastal real estate could disappear uh, underwater. Um, do you run stress tests for various climate scenarios? 
Yeah, we do. Um, and, I, you know, I'd look at it. I'm not denying there are risks around climate change and there are risks to certain business sectors uh, that exist today and business models. But I turn it around and look at the opportunity. Uh, and that is the opportunity to help clients change their business model. You know, I, I, I said to my own colleagues, I think we're about to witness the next major change in the industrial and commercial landscape of the world in the next 10 years and 15 years. I liken this to some of the changes that we've seen over the past 156 years of our history. It's one of the biggest revolutions in the industrial landscape that I think we've seen. Now that brings opportunity and it brings risk. Um, the opportunity is to finance that transition, to finance the investment in the new technologies and the new business models. And that's what excites me. Whilst being cognizant of the risks, if you don't get on that journey and you're left with all of the stranded assets of the old technologies, clearly you have a risk. So how does that understanding or vision of the world experiencing a new industrial revolution affect your lending decisions today? Um, are you more inclined to lend to businesses that are planning for a low carbon future, less inclined to lend to companies with large climate footprints? Um, I, I don't think the answer is binary because I, I, I was on a conversation earlier and I said, look, there are certain companies that are very specific on green energy or a project based company. But the vast majority of companies in the world serve all sectors and are both in today's industry and future technologies. And the real trick is to help those companies that have a mixed portfolio of activities transition their business model to the future. Um, you know, if we only do financing of pure green projects and we don't help the existing industries invest in their business models to change the technology they have, then we're going to have a very binary world. And I don't think the world is as binary as sometimes people talk about. You're not in favor of divestment. Why? No, I do think there is certain parts of the industrial landscape that are going to get progressively less finance provided to them. But I don't think that is purely a function of the finance sector regulating our companies that we bank I think the companies we bank are already thinking in that direction. In conjunction with the government policies that are being formulated, you know, the oil and gas sector that I talk to are very much interested in investing in the new technologies and lessening their dependency on um, current technologies and current energy sources. As a response to shareholder pressure, um, HSBC has just agreed uh, to phase out funding for the coal industry by 2030 in the developed world and by 2040 in the developing world. Is that not a form of divestment? That's a form of economic reality. I think everyone knows that you've got to be led by the science. The science, and I'm not a scientist, but the science is telling me that the world of the future cannot be dependent on coal as a source of energy for and be consistent with net zero by 2050. That's an economic reality with that ambition of net zero by 2050. Therefore, it's going to happen over time. And that's what we're saying. Our clients are going to transition their business models off of coal onto new sources of energy. And that will be why we will transition our balance sheet, because they are transitioning their businesses. But you've set a hard you've set a hard target. You've set a a goal. Because the science the science says you have to do that. If you don't get out of the developed world by twenty thirty, and the developing world by twenty forty, it's likely we will miss the scientific base and the scientific uh, scenario that gets us to net zero by twenty fifty. So, you know, I can't I can't turn around and pick a different date just because I like it. If the science is telling us, that's what needs to be done. What's the science telling us about oil? Why wouldn't you make a similar commitment, for instance? There are similar statements being put out there by IEA, and we're going to be working with our clients on the implementation of the IEA principles and how that will impact. Um, but again, it's not about necessarily just pulling out. It's a case of how are those oil and gas companies going to change 
their business models in light of the IEA scenario. How do you go about monitoring your clients' emissions, the so-called scope three emissions, and how does that play into your decisions on whether you loan to them and if you do loan, at what price? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrew. And, and you know, the, the, whole, the whole world, the corporate world, has to actually start to gather information that we've not previously gathered. That's the banks and our clients have got to build a much more transparent analysis of the current carbon footprint, of their plans to transition for the future. We as institutions will have an obligation to gather that information from our clients so that we can make appropriate lending decisions and, and decisions as to whether we can achieve our net zero ambition as a corp, as a company. But I think as, as, a, as an activity, there's a huge amount of uh, thinking going into how to build that transparency. And there are methodologies being discussed, PACTA and PCAF and, and science-based scenarios being used. Um, I'm chairing a task force on that, um, a group of 11 of us as banks, are trying to make sure that we develop a framework as a group of banks that can bring meaning to the phrase net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. So there isn't just a strap line, it isn't a marketing statement, it has substance. And if you use that commitment, if you use that statement in your commitment, then this is what you need to put in place as a reporting architecture for your investors and stakeholders. We're intending to publish that document, which is the Financial Services Task Force, uh, under the SMI uh, banner. Now, in the end, can we trust businesses to address the climate crisis? There are those who argue that businesses have a fiduciary duty to maximize profit, which may or may not align with the best interests of the planet. And that ultimately, it's up to government to mandate change by, for instance, introducing a carbon tax. How do you respond to that kind of argument? I, 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 you, you're implying that there's a disconnect between climate change and profit. I'm arguing there is a strong connection between climate change and profit. And that if you lean into the opportunities that exist in financing the transition to net zero, there is a significant profit opportunity for you. If you do not proactively lead into that challenge, there is a potential risk that you will end up banking stranded assets because they're no longer viable in a net zero world. So I don't see the disconnect between profit and climate. I see them strongly connected. Is there a role for government? Absolutely. Government have a strong role to play. Carbon pricing is one role they could play. It's wickedly difficult. You know, coming up with a single global price for carbon, universally accepted by all governments of the world, able to operate cross-border, is great, but it's challenging. There are other things governments can do. They can send strong market signals and have done so. The signals the UK government have made regarding the use of the combustion engine is a market signal beneath carbon pricing that can change market dynamics. Similar statements could be made around sustainable aviation fuel for the long haul aviation sector, using that as a, a means to lower the carbon footprint of the airline sector. There are many such statements that could operate below the level of a global carbon price in the absence of such a global carbon price. Does ESG investment make a difference? Critics will yeah. say that it simply amounts to a reshuffling of the portfolios. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm, again, I've been around long enough, 34 years in this organization and seen lots of different innovation and change take place. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist, but now that the world is really energized behind the need for change, that new technologies will be invented, new opportunities will be created. Those projects need to be funded. Uh, the banking sector and the financial services sector has a role to play, a strong role to play in that, as do governments. And, and if we're going to get that 2050 vision that we all want, um, we have to fund those very technologies and projects. That, but to do so, you need a strong label. You need people to be able to say, as investors, 
I see that project. I recognize it has the credentials of sustainability around it, within it. I see that it has validity. If you have a strong definition of a sustainable project, finance will follow. If you don't have a strong de definition of what is sustainable, it's hard for investors, be they equity investors or debt investors, to put their money behind that. So definition of sustainable investment is important. Now, there is a complication, Andrew, and that is, if you're just looking at a project level, you can get to a definition of a sustainable project, whether it's the EU taxonomy or others, or fast infra is in development. What worries you the most as we've been watching a procession of record-breaking heat waves, droughts, hurricanes, and so on? Will we be able, do you think, to make the shift to a low-carbon economy fast enough? I believe so. I hope so. And we're making every effort to make sure that's what happens within HSBC. You know, I'm, 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 I'm open enough and honest enough to say, I need to build greater capabilities within HSBC to be ready for those new businesses that are going to be created and those new technologies, because I want to fund them. I want to help our clients make them become a reality. Now, do I, do I personally, I'm not a scientist, do I understand all that science? No. Do my people understand it all? No. So we're building the capabilities within our organization to make sure that our frontline bankers are able to have this dialogue with their clients. And I think what the industry has done over the past 10 years, it's been very successful in, for example, the bond market, the capital market aspect. But we as an institution have got to embed that capability of financing sustainable projects throughout our activities, asset management, wealth management, SME banking, supply chain finance and trade finance in Asia, in the Middle East and around the world. Our bankers in all parts of HSBC have got to be able to make good, solid risk and opportunity assessment decisions going forward across the broad portfolio of our activity. So I'm in a very heavy build out of capability um, to make sure we're able to meet that, that requirement. Noel Quinn, thanks for your time and thank you for your insights and good luck at COP26. Thank you, Andrew. And now let's move to our live panel. Just a reminder to the audience, please do send in questions. And if you send them in, I will certainly read them out. I want to start with Tariq. You made waves a few weeks ago by writing a three-part essay in medium.com where you brutally critique all of the work you did at BlackRock, where you were in charge of ESG investing. You've gone from ESG believer to apostate. You write, and I quote, I sincerely believe that while sustainable investing was not perfect, it was a step in the right direction in the critical question of how business and society should intersect in the 21st century. But you then go on to say, quote, it's clear to me now that my work at BlackRock only made matters worse by leading the world into a dangerous mirage, an oasis in the middle of the desert that is burning valuable time. We will eventually come to regret this illusion. Tariq, what did you see at BlackRock that prompted this dramatic about face? I would say that I saw a set of tools, standards, and data sets, you know, pieces around the space that were growing and had potential if combined in a useful way for society, uh, but they weren't being. They were being combined into narratives that try to convince people that free markets self-correct without any kind of regulation and that we can solve uh, massive challenges like inequality and climate change uh, simply through the leaderships, uh, leadership of banks and financial institutions that have a fiduciary duty to maximize profits in a world where I think it's very clear from everything I saw that being irresponsible is actually profitable, right? This is one of our underlying problems. And so most of what we were doing wasn't really creating any systemic change as much as lulling a sort of fantasy that was delaying the action by government required to create that. And then as sort of we one hand, sort of the industry was uh, holding off taxes and regulation and maintaining a consensus that we could argue emerged in the 80s around the 
the idea that free markets, you know, all by themselves can solve all problems. Um, we saw, with the other hand, this creation of a set of products, and those products all purported to uh, create social impact in some meaningful way. Uh, and I would argue we're sort of in some ways created to, to exploit the social angst of society around the fact that nothing was getting done and every year inequality goes up and carbon emissions you know, uh, exceed the levels we need them to be at to hit any reasonable scenario. And those products for the most part have no impact whatsoever. There's no reason to believe that they do with any basic understanding of finance. There's no, um, you know, there's no um, reason to believe they provide for the most part additional capital to companies or causes like this. And so I became very worried that uh, for the most part, the industry was creating what I call something that looks like giving wheatgrass to a cancer patient, right? There's a slow spreading cancer. Um, you know, it's, it's a systemic crisis, much like COVID-19, but whereas the incubation period for COVID is weeks, in this case, it's decades. And that enabled the fantasy where we basically were saying, well, we can keep the status quo the same way. And, you know, uh, and Wall Street was selling a bunch of products that for the most part were just shifting money around and, and, and handing it to socially conscious investors at higher fees. Um, and, you know, with no evidence that it creates any social impact whatsoever, and now evidence emerging that the messages around that um, actively mislead the public into believing that we don't need government reform, we don't need regulatory reform, which of course is what all of our societal experts and economists and Nobel right. Prize winners are telling us. So, it, it created so, a delay. So, you're, so just, just, just to follow up, your, your argument, if I'm reading you correctly, hinges on the idea that the only real answer to climate change is to put a price on carbon. Absent that incentive, car uh, companies will continue to focus on short-term profits at the expense of long-term health of the planet. But that seems to me a bit impractical. I mean, you just heard Noel Quinn say that it was going to be a carbon tax is wickedly difficult. The US is not going to put a tax on carbon. Many developing economies, the fastest growing source of emissions in the world, won't do that either. Listen, there's no question that implementing a carbon tax is going to be politically difficult, but it's also what our experts are telling us we need to do. I would turn around to business leaders that say that it's very difficult to do anything because public opinion against, is against it and say, well, what are you doing to help that? It, it's, I don't think it makes sense for business leaders to, on one hand, be saying, you know, um, you know, using their marketing divisions to create the impression that we don't need regulation, using lobbying efforts to slow that down, belonging to industry organizations that are reflexively anti-taxes and regulation. And frankly, by going out there and saying that, listen, this is a wonderful investment opportunity and we want to make money from it, when clearly the economic consensus is that this is going to cost, this is going to cost us $50 trillion to decarbonize the world economy. Um, you can't have it both ways, right? And, and, and sort of say, well, yeah. this government's not doing anything, but you're also weaving a thesis that's misleading the public into believing that we don't need government to do anything. Before we, before we get to Anne, just, just I mean, I, I'm starting to feel a little sympathy um, for your former boss at BlackRock, Larry Fink. I mean, he can't do anything about putting in place a carbon tax. He doesn't run the government. He does, however, run a massive pool of capital that could nudge companies in the right direction. In other words, he's doing what he can. What's wrong with that? I, I think that the issue is uh, the about around the messaging. Right. I would agree. I don't think that Larry Fink can solve all of our problems, but isn't. I think that he can't and is implying that he can. It's one thing for him to go out there and say, listen, finance is going to follow the money. We're structured to do that. That's I don't he, he doesn't even control what the portfolio managers do. They have a fiduciary obligation to improve returns and, and elite and financial incentives to do it. Um, it would be one thing if those leaders went and said, listen, we can't solve these problems and we need government to come and, and create the incentives and structure to do that. Kind of like, you know, athletes in a game saying at some point this game is getting dirty and it's in no one's interest and we need referees. But that's not what's being said. What's being said is that this is an enormous investment opportunity, that social purpose is the answer to societal angst. And we have to ask ourselves, I mean, would... I, I, I am a fan of Larry. I think he's brilliant. Um, but at the same time, you know, he holds a bunch of positions that I think are not coherent. One of them is believing okay. that capitalism is too short term. And the other is saying that capitalism can solve long term social issues at the same time. OK, let's let's bring in um, and and li listening to Tariq, I'm reminded of that quote. Everything must change for everything to remain the same. Is that what's happening in ESG? Um, it's is it 
really business as usual in an environmental packaging? Uh, no. I, I mean, the first thing where I, I completely agree with Tarek is this question of the ESG gold rush, all the new money flooding into funds, the marketing opportunity. But this isn't something specific to ESG. You know, snake oil is as old as the hills. And uh, if you look back on the early court cases complaining about snake oil, the complaint was there's no snakes in the snake oil. Uh, uh, the, the later court cases were, well, why are we taking snake oil for everything from impotence to hair loss to, you know, uh, preventing aging or whatever these miraculous claims were. So I, I think this puts a premium on uh, an area of reform, which is long overdue, which is you know, thinking about investor governance. So there's a big agenda, rightly so, around corporate governance, corporate reporting. You know, I, I, I think the other thing Tarek is rightly pointing to is the role of government. But asset owners like CalPERS fully understand it's not only, but also. We need uh, the financial markets, well, need two things from regulators. One is the markets rely upon a flow of information. And right now, we simply do not have uh, the standards uh, and metrics for integrating this sustainability information into the corporate reporting that investors rely upon. So all praise to the IFRS, to the work at the EU, and also work underway at the SEC. So the regulatory side, in part, is responding to investors who are going there and saying, look, we can't do our part in the financial markets unless you do your part, which is to get um, the, the disclosure rules in place. That's one piece. The second piece is incentives. Likewise, you look at initiatives like the investor agenda, which was formed before the Paris Agreement. So. I, the presence of finance, civil society, and business. Genuinely, I was, you know, there in those meetings in Paris. That was the first time there had been a COP at which you had this very broad range of input. It wasn't just government ministers stuck in a basement drinking coffee from styrofoam cups. It was an understanding that this partnership between public, private, and civil society is what's needed to get us over the line. So even. Um, if we're looking at the role of investment managers, we have to appreciate they're investing other people's money. You know, Larry Fink is not investing $7 trillion that he inherited from his auntie Mabel. This money is the savings that have been accumulated from, you know, millions of hardworking people and put into the financial system, which is why ultimately we have a common interest in the long term making sure we have this sustainability uh, integrated into the financial markets. Now, I would say the other issue is what can be done by the financial markets without those policy reforms. And I'm a little more optimistic uh, about, you know, things being wickedly dif difficult is not unusual. If something is as complex and challenging as pricing an externality like uh, the impact of global warming via carbon emissions. Don't expect that to be simple, particularly when we don't have a world autocratic government that can just simply write the rules. But certainly this has been on the agenda for investors from before the Paris Agreement. Likewise, the call for mandatory risk reporting has been on the agenda. Now at COP26, we finally got to the point where I think there's some consensus on the regulatory front, both for uh, International Accounting Standards Board and the IFRS that governs it, establishing a new uh, standard setting body and for the SEC agreeing to write these rules. Um, the, the other thing I do want to say is the asset owners like CalPERS, and I just, just for clarity, um, most of our money is internally managed, about 80% of the portfolio is internally managed and we're not clients of BlackRock. However, BlackRock was right there with us voting to put new directors onto the board of Exxon. Why did that matter? Because Exxon was one of the companies refusing to budge on some quite big strategic issues. Uh, and we're at the point where we say, well, the answer here is not to divest and pass your shares off to someone else. The issue here is actually to hold the board of directors accountable. So the, the fund management industry needs to be serving the needs of their clients, who are the asset owners in one form or another. 
And making sure we have that accountability and reporting built into the system is very important. And you bring an, uh, an awesome amount of financial firepower uh, to this battle. Um, $400 billion through CULPAs, $55 trillion through the Climate Action 100 plus initiative. You gave an example of changing the board or shuffling the board at Exxon. What other examples can you provide? Three new directors. Three, three, new, three, new, three new directors uh, at Exxon. Can you give us some other examples of how you have exercised your financial leverage to change corporate behavior? Yeah, let me let me give you two examples. The, the first thing is to frame all of this work as risk and return. That anchors it onto the fiduciary duty that we have to our two million members. You know, the firefighters, the judges, the janitors, the public servants in California relying on us, not just for pensions, but for health care as well. So a pension fund has a social purpose. Uh, however, that social purpose is going to be fulfilled if we're successful on the financial returns. So for every dollar we pay in pensions, uh, over 50 cents comes from investments. So one reason we, well, me particularly, not a fan of ESG as the way to describe this is there's no F for finance. So the way we frame this at CalPERS, and we did this some years ago, is to redefine what we mean by investment. So we say there are three forms of capital that need to be effectively managed to produce long-term sustainable value. There's financial capital, yes, the traditional day job of an investor to manage that. But also we're saying human capital, natural capital are the three that need to be holistically managed. So even if we're looking at an issue like climate change, we also need to be thinking about the impact on the workforce, on communities, on supply lines and so forth. And that holistic approach, thinking about financial, human and natural capital being managed together is, um, I, I, I think, a, a ultimately a more practical way of thinking about this issue than ESG over here is an acronym and then you've got to find some way to integrate it. And if you're a fund manager, you're an intermediary, so then you've got to sell things to earn fees. You know, if, if you start at the top of the investment chain with the asset owners and look at the way that not just CalPERS, but others are thinking about it, uh, you'll see that we're approaching it as a fiduciary issue, um, as part of our fiduciary duty to our beneficiaries. Now, what difference does it make? Well, I think investors have, as I said, had a very um, uh, visible impact on the corporate reporting agenda. Um, you know, just for CalPERS, we sat on the advisory committee at the SEC, also for CII, my colleague James Andrews sits on the IFRS Advisory Council. You know, we are actively present and involved with the regulatory agencies. We give testimony to Congress, we write uh, comment letters and all of that. So that's one area of work, that's advocacy. The engagement piece, obviously, Exxon was this season's high watermark in terms of board accountability and showing what investors can do. But I'd like to quote something from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, as, is, as we're on a Bloomberg meeting. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful to, yesterday to see the report where Bloomberg has calculated what's the value in terms of reducing emissions of the Climate Action 100 plus results. So I think you all know where this came from. We looked at 10,000 companies in our CalPERS public equity portfolio. We found that 100, less than 100 actually, were responsible for over 80% of the emissions. So this question of can it be done, is it wickedly simple or just, you know, simple in the normal way of being very complicated, what we did was say we need to have three things for these 100 companies. Uh, governance, so Exxon example, hold boards accountable, but also align compensation uh, towards yeah. the net zero goals. Political donations, because we need to untangle shareholder money from the policy and rule writing process. And also that we want strategies put forward for a just transition. And for this, we've built out a benchmark which tracks everything from CapEx to those political donations, time bound, emissions, reduction targets, and so forth. So to answer your question, we can go through individual company examples, but as a cohort in the 100 plus, Bloomberg has a new energy finance assess that the 111 companies which we have um, engaged rigorously and vigorously that have set 
net zero targets. Remember, these are very tough companies in hard to abate sectors, you know, steel, cement, utilities, aviation, agriculture, and as well as the production side. Um, those 111 companies, the, the, the emissions value of that net zero commitment is equivalent to China's annual emissions. So we're talking about very significant impact that investors can drive that will take us part of the way. But then investors also know they need public policy to come in alongside this to accelerate the pace and scale of what's going to be needed. On the and plus that, side, that's yeah, risk. Sorry. Let me just add one very, very quick other point. Um, and I, I think this was well, well said in your uh, clip at the beginning about with HSBC. Because we have to deploy capital to earn returns, to pay pensions and health care, uh, we're also very interested, not just in the doom and gloom, but also in the opportunity. And when we did our own first TCFD report uh, published last year, we assessed that um, about 20% of our private markets assets are now invested in climate solutions. So we need to both be the stewards to drive down the emissions and create the demand for the clean energy across all of these sectors, uh, but we also have a huge opportunity by deploying new capital into the opportunities that are there as well. So we need to be doing both. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. That, that's 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 a great point. I'm glad you brought up Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which always comes <laughs> up with the, the, We're the great very fans. best data. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, Tariq, before we get your um, your response to what Anne has has, has just said, um, I'd like to go to our first audience poll. And um, uh, the question is, um, uh, the question is, does ESG investing make a difference in the race to net zero? Now, we've given you four options here. Yes, uh, it's becoming an unstoppable force that obliges managers to consider the planet before profits. B, not yet but it will once we have better standards in place for reporting. C, it's a great concept, but it can't make enough of an impact in time to help meaningfully reduce emissions. D, no, this is all just um, greenwashing. T Tariq, while our audience um, uh, comes up with their answers to that, um, Anne makes the point that it's not either or. Can we agree that perhaps a carbon tax is the first best option, ESG investing, uh, maybe the second best. So uh, I would, that argument would have made sense to me a year or two ago. The reason I went public and made the argument that I have is, as I mentioned in the third part of the paper, that evidence is emerging. And I uh, worked with the university in Canada to actually do a new study on this, that ESG investing and the messages around it are destroying the political foundation to create government reform. So there is becoming an either or. Right. There, there, we can't say that ESG investing is a plus on top and it's not taking away from government action when there's clear evidence that the more you talk to the average person in the public about it, the more there's a statistic, statistically significant difference where they say we don't need government action. Um, to put it this way, it's if you have a competitive playing field, the athletes are arguing we don't need rules and referees to change how the game is played. And if they spend billions of dollars marketing that and saying that and saying that good sportsmanship is the answer and we can build all the solutions we need that seem to be without government action, even though, again, the experts in our society and Nobel Prize winning economists are telling us we do, those messages actually mislead the public. And so that's the reason I went public because it went from saying ESG is you know, a good effort to do things that could be useful to taking, you know, zooming out and looking at the arc of history and realizing that this could be all the product of a set of win-win fantasies that unfortunately, you know, they, there's no question that some of the tools and some of what's being done is moving in the right direction. So I agree with Anne on all of that. Where I get worried is the fact that is it moving fast enough, right? We all know progress is being made. We could spend hours talking about initiatives, capital, you know, small wins here and there. But then if you zoom out and you look at the overall report card, it's clearly not doing what we need done fast enough. It's clear that the experts are telling us that we need a set of reforms that will move those forward. For example, internalizing the externality through a carbon tax. And I get worried that the messaging that we don't need to internalize the externality or that there's a win-win solution where managers, you know, they don't, we don't internalize the externality, but managers consider it more. 
So now there's a process where the externality exists, but people are focused on it more when they make decisions. Having been a, a portfolio manager and having worked on one extreme end of distressed investing, a part of the market that fills the void left when people divest and you know they run a, run away from from out of favor assets, I can tell you that we would be all over that. We would invest in anything that was legal and made money. And the truth is, I mean, Calpers is one of our investors, right? If there was a greater market opportunity in distressed, we would have gone and raised more money to attack it. That's not that's not disparaging the system as much as I think it is being realistic about the way that it works. And the results we've seen over the last few years are that as ESG uh, messaging has grown, as ESG initiatives have grown, as the assets under management have grown, they've grown alongside carbon emissions and inequality. And if and today, the more than 50 percent of millennials don't believe in capitalism. I think there's an important one point I'd finish with. There's an important point I have to make around privilege. It's the idea that, you know, we're all in this together fighting climate change. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case, because when Noel Quinn says that he's optimistic about everything going on, I think if Noel's book was the same as Greta Thunberg's and he was 18, I'm not sure that he would be that optimistic. And, and that's just saying that, listen, like timeline matters. And right now, for not moving fast enough, we're creating the, the sort of the preconditions for, you know, a fantasy that says capitalism can fix itself. Um, and the idea that it's not, you know, it's not coming at the expense of government action when the evidence is showing that it does. And we may be just prolonging a system that is, you know, oriented toward the short term and endangering the long term public interest. Well, perhaps another answer to this question, Terry, is to fix the flaws in the ESG set up faster, put more pressure on funds to truly go green. I mean, you know, how, how, how do you reallocate capital in a way that encourages companies to contribute to the climate transition? Well, I think there's, there's, um, there's an interesting point in there. I wouldn't throw out ESG. The idea is not to just say that it's all nonsense. A lot of people actually don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I would, I would agree with that. I think that there are, as I've said, tools, standards, and human capital that are useful. There are narratives and products that are potentially dangerous. Um, and I think that there is an ESG 2.0 that is a more rigorous about what can be achieved and what can't be right. So that means that we can't go around marketing ETS as providing more capital sustainable alternatives when they're not really. And I think that there is a second point around sort of being um, uh, uh, open and honest around the fact uh, that there are limits, right? Responsible business doesn't mean uh, I think business leaders going out and talking about stakeholder capitalism is serving all stakeholders when, you know, all the recent studies show that that sort of seems to be more PR. I think it's about understanding the limitations of what can be achieved in the system that is built through the sort of mechanics of fiduciary duty where a market failure still persists. Right. I mean, and that's where ESG is a little bit dangerous today, I think, because it creates the idea that this can solve our problems. And again, what I saw at the largest asset manager in history across the data was that being responsible is not necessarily profitable um, or that useful to investing. And if it's not creating any impact and it's potentially delaying reforms we need, then we have to have that debate. OK, let's go to the uh, results of our poll. Um, uh, 22% think that uh, ESG is becoming an unstoppable force. More, 39%, um, if I'm reading that correctly, uh, think that it will once we have better standards in place. Um, and uh, very few people think uh, that it is, in fact, um, greenwashing. Um, and to, to, to this point, um, reporting standards um, have been all over the map. Tariq points out actually in his trilogy in uh, Medium, depending on how you, you measure it, Exxon may actually be greener than, than Tesla. Isn't part of the answer um, uh, to greenwashing greater transparency, putting pressure on companies to report climate risk in a consistent way so that investors can make informed decisions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I would liken this to going into a shop to buy a tin of beans or a can of beans, I should say, for our American audience. Uh, you go into a shop, the tin just says beans in here, uh, price to be agreed with the cashier on the way out. You know, we don't accept that. 
uh, as a form of reporting for nutrition, you know, for even simple things. So it's no different when a consumer is buying a financial product and there are existing, uh, you know, concepts of giving best advice of fiduciary duty, which is overarching, in which the snake oil side of the selling game needs to be addressed. Now, uh, the SEC is acutely aware of this. I mean, they issued a risk alert uh, earlier in the year uh, shot across the bows to say we are inspecting and we will be enforcing because this is if it's false advertising whether it's on uh, so-called ESG or it's on anything else that's actually uh, against the rules um, so you know getting those enforcement mechanisms is in place that that then poses the question which you're rightly focusing on which is well what should we put on the label on our can of beans our tin of beans you know how do we give uh, the concept of true and fair, which we re insist upon uh, to guide financial reporting under US GAAP, under IFRS internationally. So the important focus now is to get those standards written and developed. And I have high hopes for the new International Sustainability Standards Board. Think about that. This is going to be part of the delivery mechanism for corporate reporting into 140 markets where we expect to have information on the finances, which is consistent, comparable, auditable, uh, and, and, uh, you know, and interpreted and enforced through that regulatory mechanism. Now, if you look at what the SEC is doing, you know, we and other investors were able to argue before the pandemic that this same approach, we're talking about climate change today, I know, but the same applies to human capital management. If you look at the S&P 500 balance sheet, you'll see it's 85% intangibles. Uh, so even if you just are interested to know where does risk come from, where, what, what's driving returns in a company, you know, the current framework for corporate reporting is just too limited. So we do need the externalities pricing. That's not just carbon pricing, I would add to this, hundreds of billions of dollars of fossil fuel industry subsidies. We need to pull the rug out on that. That's public money, taxpayer money, which could be deployed into, into better things, but as well as the carbon pricing. Um, the other thing is that we need to focus on this reporting regime. Finally, we've got to find ways to extend that approach into private markets. And this has been something I know this conversation has been largely about the, the public markets, but what's happening in private markets is becoming increasingly important. So the, the, the same applies here in terms of the, the standards and the reporting, financial, human, and natural capital. If you get all those three properly accounted for, and I use the word accounted for advisedly, you're going to actually find the financial markets in a better position. However, the SEC and other regulators have to uh, continue with their, you know, standard enforcement to make sure that, you know, it does what it says on the tin. In other words, these products right. actually match up. They're getting away with it at the moment because there is no standard definition of what should be in the tin. So that's Ta the piece of work that needs doing next. Tariq, Anne, Anne has mentioned uh, this idea of snake oil several times now. You, you were in the business of selling what Anne describes as uh, parts of the industry, at least snake oil. At one point in, 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 your, in your critique, you talk about ESG funds being a way for in, um, asset managers to differentiate and in differentiating, it allows them to charge higher fees. Is that what this is all about? I think the majority of the products by dollar value out there that have the the title sustainable on it are effectively not increasing any capital at all to environmental causes in any way that we could measure or uh, creating any impact against any any specific metrics. I mean, think of an ESG ETF, the average person who buys that. Imagine a retail investor or a millennial who decides that this seems like a good way to invest their 401k almost certainly believes, and we saw this based on the study we did, that they're creating social impact that would not have otherwise occurred, right? This idea of additionality. In fact, all that's happening is a bunch of secondary shares or trillions of which you know, are already traded in public markets are having you know, the basket slightly adjusted so that you, know, you can charge socially conscious investors a few more basis points for the privilege of having value alignment. The, if you actually look at the theory of change for how that creates impact, and, and I did, and that's why I realized this is a problem. 
It's the exact same theory of change of divestment, right? Soft, you know, ETFs, it's, it's just soft divestment. Green bonds, the same thing. You, you could make an argument they're just moving money around from one side to the other. And if it doesn't create any impact, then, you know, $400 billion of these products may just be reshuffling things that already exist, giving us the impression that $400 billion have gone towards green energy and, you know, moving the needle when, in fact, they're just reshuffling existing things, you know, and, and, and getting a bit of a fee bump. Tariq, I was just reading a report um, from one of the top business schools in Europe, EDHEC, called Doing Good or Feeling Good. And it was saying that academic research shows that only about 12% of so-called green funds are actually green, that in fact, the weighting is enormously towards market capitalization. Was that true of the funds that you were engaged in? I mean, I can't speak specifically to, to BlackRock. So as I look across the industry, generally, I did see that, you know, there were the game in the industry, I think, is to take an existing product, make the minimal amount of changes you can to whatever it is, because it's already been optimized in some way, um, while getting the maximum marketing benefit from a green perspective. And so in a situation like that, where the incentives are set up like that, I think you're going to find a lot of products that are, are sort of uh, mislabeled. And I would I would be worried about the fact that, number one, even if you label them better, right, and you you know the SEC is successful, they're still weak grass. There's no evidence that any of them have any real world impact, number one. And number two, I worry about the idea that transparency alone is actually the solution. I mean, there's been transparency around CEO pay for decades. Guess what? It went up. There's been transparency in New York around calorie counts. It hasn't brought obesity. If the market failure persists, the fact that there's a transparency around it doesn't change the fact that the participants in that system are incentivized to fund and burn more fossil fuel than we need to occur as a society today because of the persistence of a market failure we still haven't corrected. Um, again, you could say that the market failure is too hard to correct and so on and so forth, but right. the evidence is emerging that we can't correct it so long as businesses out there are making the argument that this set of other solutions are a nearly as good version to it versus what I would call, frankly, a distraction that is, is burning valuable time. We're yeah, running I, out of I time. For, sorry, Anne, we're running out of time. I, and and I, yeah. wanted, I wanted to ask you, if, if I may, I wanted to get to the final question around divestment, because a lot of our uh, audience are very interested in, in this question. Um, we've just heard from Noel Quinn at HSBC, and. Um, uh, that um, HSBC is getting out of coal, a decision that the bank made as a result of pressure from activist shareholders. That's surely a form of divestment, isn't it? Can't a similar argument be made for oil and other carbon intensive industries? How do you look at this whole issue of divestment? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, the, the point about divestment is it depends what you're trying to achieve. If you think divestment is going to change the company, um, good luck, because all that happens with divestment is one investor sells their shares to another investor who may or may not care, uh, who may or may not be in public markets with reporting requirements as they come forwards. So if your reason for divesting is you see that those risks are ahead and they can't be mitigated through engagement, in other words, how do you transition a coal company into uh, a renewables company? Um, then there's going to be a point where you have to walk away because you just don't see that as credible. And for CalPERS, we've got several, several sectors where we've come to that view. Tobacco is a good example. You know, we don't see a way to engage tobaccos and companies, turn them into broccoli companies. And furthermore, the, there is no wider economic dependence other than for the poor benighted addicted customers of nicotine, there is no uh, econo further economic purpose being served. Whereas if you look at uh, fossil fuels, the reason that we have this engagement strategy for change is because the world right now is heavily dependent on these fossil fuels. If you sell your shares just in the producers of the oil and gas, you might feel, you know, I've done a marvelous thing for the planet. However, those oil and gas emissions, 80% of them are going to be uh, put into the atmosphere as those products are used across the rest of your portfolio. So the cement companies, the steel companies, transport, agriculture, dependence on fossil fuels means you can't simply be 
uh, able to, to mitigate the risk simply by focusing on the, the production. We've got to bend the curve. The demand has got to come down. So that Tariq, is do you agree with that? Do you agree with yeah. that, Tariq? Get, get out of the oil companies or stay in and fight? I think we're missing an obvious third option. If you get out, it's a complete waste of time. I think divestment has no value whatsoever. And I would tell you that it's like in investors I talk to in the Middle East, they divest of you know, alcohol companies. Not one of them thinks that's going to stop people from drinking in France, right? We've divested of porn companies. This doesn't change anything beyond, I would argue, sort of an ability to cover yourselves. So I agree divestment doesn't help. I worry that engagement is also a distraction because, again, if you're a you have a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder returns and you're on the board of an oil company. Like I can get a first year banking analyst to do the model on that. They're going to tell you that the, the way you protect your profits and you maximize shareholder return market lobby, keep a carbon tax away as long as you can and to keep exploiting that resource as much as you can. People in oil companies tell me that, which right? point I mean, Tariq, the answer is that we cannot, off the board. Compliance. <laughs> we cannot rely on voluntary compliance where when there's a market failure, it just doesn't make sense. Fiduciary duty, voluntary compliance, it doesn't make sense. You can do something on the margins, but if I was on the board of a gun company tomorrow, what am I going to tell them to stop selling guns? I mean, again, a first year banking analyst can tell you that the best way to keep our profits existing would be to keep gun control at bay, right? If you want less you know, shootings, you probably want the government to restrict it. At some point, we have to accept that there's a third answer and it exists outside of the neoliberal universe of looking at how markets work. And it's that there are rules and referees and they need to be updated. It's obviously the answer. Our mm -hmm. societal experts are telling us, us that. I mean, if, if with COVID-19, imagine we said that the answer was not the government should close the schools and bars and restaurants and everything to bend down the curve rapidly. The answer is we should go one by one and join school boards and convince them to close. I mean, at some point, that's not a systemic solution. Right? Not, it's, it may be better than no, nothing. And let's 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 let's, let's, let's get the last strategy. word to Anne, please. Yeah, Tariq, you're setting up your straw object to knock it down. Investors are calling on governments to do their part. They're calling on civil society. That's a partnership that matters as well. And Pardon then, me. as the owners, part of we have responsibilities too? too. All of the above. Everyone we, has uh, What exactly? We, government, what, what are the best governments to do? I'm not sure about that. I mean, have I seen a consensus the out of investor investors and in the financial community? No, read the investor agenda. I don't think you know it, but it's but there, a so wait, there's evidence that what investors are putting out there are, is, is destroying. There's evidence emerging that what investors are saying around ESG is destroying the political foundation for government action. How do you address that? The reverse. It's highlighting the evidence, growing I mean, there's studies for the issues to be part of the public policy agenda. And that's true from the civil society activists through to the investors, through to the companies. We're the owners of this problem. We provide the capital and we own these companies and we need to be part of the solution. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you. No one's and it. no it's one's been an absolutely fascinating game. It's been a, a fascinating conversation and we, we clearly haven't haven't finished it. We're gonna have to have you back again for round two. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, insights. And um, um, we have a, uh, a final uh, gonna um, um, we're going to a final uh, go to a final segment um, where we talk to um, Vice President of New Energy Business and Development Jay Hyuk Oh at um, Hyundai Motor Company. I talked to him last week about Hyundai's commitment to reaching net zero by 2045 and how hydrogen technology is a key factor in the company's roadmap. Take a listen. Dr. O, oh, Hyundai has just announced its commitment to get to net zero by 2045. And one of the strategies is based on hydrogen, replacing fossil fuels, not just for cars, and trams, and other mobility solutions, um, but also as one of the primary energy sources. And Hyundai is going to invest $6.8 billion in this project. Why this huge bet on hydrogen? Yeah, um, yeah, there can be many different type of answers, but uh, you know, like uh, I, I want to say this: 
um, you know, I guess it is uh, not only because, you know, we chose hydrogen as a uh, you know, stairway to uh, net zero, but also because we believe hydrogen is going to play a very important role in the realization of Paris Climate Agreement. Um, I guess like, I have to elucidate what I just said. So, uh, you know, like, let's uh, first, hydrogen makes it possible to economically store renewable energy in a large scale. In fact, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen's cost for storing 100 megawatt hour energy is calculated to be just one third of uh, battery's cost. So the more energy to be stored, uh, the more competitive hydrogen uh, becomes compared with uh, you know, batteries. So there is a, a clear you know, cost effectiveness uh, on uh, hydrogen. Um, next, you know, th like maybe uh, you know you are wondering why uh, you know uh, is so important to uh, you know economically store renewable energy in large scale. Uh, that's because uh, the amount of renewable energy available uh, sign significantly varies uh, in a time to time and region by region. And hence, surplus, huge surplus of uh, renewable energy is, uh, uh, is uh, inevitable. So, um, for example, it is forecasted that uh, there will be a huge renewable energy surplus uh, up to 170 terawatt hour uh, uh, every year from 2050 only in Germany. So, so, so huge, you know, surplus, you know, we should, you know, uh, use it instead of throwing it away. So being able to economically store uh, renewable energy uh, in large scale instead of throwing it away plays a critical role in making investments uh, in renewable energy profitable, and hence making such investments uh, in happen in practice. I, IEA forecasted that uh, in order to achieve the goal of Paris Climate Agreement, uh, the portion of renewable energy in the you know, global energy mix should be up to 67% uh, by 2050. I believe it is not impossible, I mean, to achieve that 67% uh, in practice since investment in hydrogen is uh, profitable and hence uh, is going to happen. So as a result, uh, we can conclude that, you know, hydrogen uh, is one of the, you know, one of, uh, you know, must have for achieving the goal of uh, Paris climate agreement. And I guess this may be a, a more important reason, you know, for why Hyundai is so ambitious and aggressive about hydrogen. By the way, uh, you know, like I want to you know, add up this, uh, you know, based on the sad importance of hydrogen, uh, it's expected that by 2050, hydrogen uh, reduced uh, six gigaton of carbon dioxide annually and creates uh, about the 2.5 trillion dollar market together with 30 million new jobs. So why not you know, hydrogen and why not uh, invest uh, in hydrogen that much? Well, the science is fascinating, but what are you doing to improve the cost effectiveness of hydrogen? Yeah. Um, actually, you know, Hyundai is doing uh, its best, I mean, to innovate the production, storing, transportation, refueling, and utilization of hydrogen uh, in order to strengthen the cost effectiveness of uh, hydrogen. For example, uh, the, uh, the electrolyzers uh, we are developing will offer 10% higher efficiency and 40% lower capex, uh, both of which I believe will lead to significant cost reduction in hydrogen production. Also, our ammonia crackers, uh, which crack ammonia to produce hydrogen uh, with uh, the most competitive uh, efficiency and capex, um, will enable storing, trading of hydrogen in the form of ammonia 
uh, which will lead to a significant cost reduction in hydrogen storing and transportation. So, uh, uh, in addition to those two, you know, I want to mention about these two. You know, our state of the art uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell uh, based power generation systems are going to create steady demand for hydrogen, which actually encourages the investment on hydrogen supply side, and hence uh, contributes to uh, further improving the cost effectiveness of hydrogen. So including the examples that I just shared with you, uh, Hyundai is uh, 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 doing its best to uh, innovate every aspect in hydrogen uh, value chain so that the resultant cost effectiveness of hydrogen should be good enough uh, to prove that storing uh, and uh, trading renewable energy in the form of hydrogen economically makes sense. And hence, so much of renewable energy requested by Paris uh, climate agreement also economically makes sense in practice. What particularly caught my eye in the Hyundai announcement um, was this idea of a uh, hundred percent electrification of vehicles as a pathway to net zero. Can you tell us what kind of innovations Hyundai is undertaking um, to get to that goal? Hmm. I guess, you know, like a, well, every automaker is uh, trying to innovate uh, the uh, you know, electrification itself, but uh, I have a little bit different view, by the way. So, you know, by the way, uh, you know, Hyundai, you know, plans to achieve, you know, 100% electrification of new vehicles in Europe by 2035 and the other, you know, major markets in the world, you know, by 2040. Since you know transportation sector is responsible for about 16 percent of the global carbon emissions, so uh, you know 100 percent electrification was to be critical to uh, getting to net zero. Um, but from the viewpoint of energy, 100 uh, percent electrification uh, has some implications uh, that should be resolved. I mean to achieve. 100% uh, electrification in practice. So one of those uh, implications is the increase of electricity peak demand caused by EV charging. You know, for example, um, assuming just uh, you know 10 kilowatt, uh, you know, slow charging only, like as in uh, you know res residential uh, you know facilities. Um, one, let's suppose that there are 100,000 electric electric vehicles then uh, those electric vehicles will uh, result in one gigawatt peak demand. This means that in order to, in order to uh, accommodate, you know, that, you know, 100,000 electric vehicles, uh, it is necessary to one gigawatt power plant and relevant electricity supply infrastructure, which for your, for your information, costed about you know five billion dollars in 2016 in Korea. So, five billion dollars for just coping with the peak demand is too much. So I believe we have to somehow reduce the peak demand, uh, you know, from EV charging. So, a one solution that Hyundai suggests is uh, you know hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, especially as a long, long range heavy duty uh, mobility solution, uh, which can, um, you know, significantly reduce uh, the peak demand uh, caused by uh, just uh, EV charging. Hydrogen uh, fuel, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles also need a huge investment in uh, building hydrogen supply infrastructure. Uh, but uh, it is I believe worthwhile I mean, for you and me and everybody uh, to invest in hydrogen, as I uh, you know, explained earlier. So the other solution that we are developing uh, is the so-called uh, demand management technology uh, by which we can more precisely uh, predict uh, electricity demand, less painfully uh, control EV charging, 
and as a result, uh, effectively reduce the peak demand posed by EVs under our demand management. So, you know, what I can say is that Hyundai is uh, pursuing 100% electrification uh, and in parallel, uh, innovations to uh, resolve its implications. We believe, however, uh, solving implications cannot be done by Hyundai alone, but needs strong support from customers and governments. Dr. Oh, the whole world will be looking with interest at Hyundai's pathway to net zero. Thank you for your insights into Hyundai's 100% electrification project, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Dr. O oh and to Hyundai for taking the time out to do that interview on the exciting work they're doing. That's our show for today. We want to thank Tariq Fancy, Ann Simpson, and Noel Quinn for joining us earlier in the program. And to our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg New Economy community, thanks for joining us. You can follow the conversation with BBG New Economy on Twitter or like us on Facebook. Please look for updates on social media regarding the annual forum, which is coming up in November 17 to 19 in Singapore. Until then,